My name is Jeremy Kaplan, and I lead this program, and, and, and I'm excited to be joined by a group of alums of the program who you will meet shortly. These are people who can give you a real, authentic, on-the-ground view of what it's actually like to be in a program like this one and what their experience is, and can also tell you about their journeys as, as entrepreneurs, as, as um, indie journalists creating new ventures around the world. So, so that's one of the key things that you'll take away from today, I hope, is, is what it's like to, to build something and what that journey is like and what our program is like. Those are our main topics of focus for today. So I am excited for the next block of time. We'll also have time for questions. So you'll have an opportunity to ask whatever it is that you're wondering about. There might be something you're wondering that's a technical question about the program or a logistical question or a financial question or a practical question or a an intellectual question. Um, whatever it might be, um, hopefully we'll have a chance to answer those questions. And chances are, if you're wondering about something, there's someone else who's also wondering something similar. So feel free to drop questions into the chat that I'll try to answer along the way, or others in the room can answer along the way. And then we'll also have some dedicated time toward the end for, for Q and A, uh, where you can ask, raise your voice and ask whatever it is that you'd like to know either, um, of me or of anyone who's been in the program who you'll hear from, um, shortly. So with that, I want to um, invite you to uh, respond to a, a quick poll question. I'm curious about folks in the room um, about essentially what, what brings you here today. Um, so are you already building something? You're kind of thinking about building your existing project even further in new directions. Are you thinking about starting something that you haven't quite started yet, but you're contemplating that or considering that? Um, or is this just something of interest to you for some other reason related to your professional interests? So I'll give you a moment to, to answer that. Okay, it looks like we've got two thirds of people responding. I'll give you another few moments and then we'll wrap it up. Okay, so I'm going to close the poll and share the results. And uh, you should be able to see that uh, more than half of you are considering launching your own thing. Um, there's a handful, uh, quarter, uh, a little over a quarter actually, that are um, looking to build an existing project even further. And then a couple of you uh, think this sounds interesting. So whatever camp you're in, hopefully you'll benefit from the, the session today. And I wanna to turn to a quick, quick presentation to walk you through what the program is about and how it works. And then we'll dive into our conversation with the alums um, who are joining us from all over the world. So the Entrepreneurial Journalism Program has been around since 2010 in one way or another. Um, this is actually the second iteration of the program. Uh, the, the fully online version of the program is, is new as of um, the fall of 2020. So it's a pretty new program. We've already had seven cohorts. Those of you who apply to join the next cohort will be part of the eighth cohort um, in terms of the in, the uh, online program. And we had uh, nine cohorts before that in person. So this is a program that we've developed over a long period of time. And our goal basically is to help you, um, help those of you who are independent journalists uh, to develop ventures that are sustainable. And ventures can be projects of all kinds. And I'll show you a bunch of examples of what those projects look like in a few moments. And we do that through this 100 day online program. So people all over the world join and spend time with us for 100 days in a concentrated period of time, get to know each other, are part of a, a collaborative cohort. There are events, there are workshops, there are resources that are associated with that. Um, and our goal really is to help you thrive in the future as an independent journalist or as a journalist who is working in a niche subject area, whatever it is that you might be, be doing. So my aim in the next few minutes is to give you a preview of what, what that's actually like. So what is the 100-day program actually like? What do you actually do? What do you learn? Who's teaching? All those kinds of things. Um, just a reminder, all of this information is online. We'll post the link in the chat. Again, if you want to check out the, the site, it has more detail. You can refer to that. also has the application, which is free to complete, relatively short, relatively easy, relatively painless, no test, no references, um, no cost required for any of the for the application and relatively simple and straightforward, no complicated paperwork. And also no um, no degree requirements. We don't require you have a PhD or a master's or anything like that. 
So it's it's open ended. We want to encourage uh, as many different kinds of people to apply as as possible. Uh, so if you want more information, that's one one way of 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 getting it. Basically, the three things you'll accomplish if you are part of this program over the 100 days that the program runs between March 18th and June 13th are um, refining your product. So either clarifying a product, if you have an idea for something, which many of you do, as you noted in your poll, you'll clarify the idea for the product and carefully kind of think through who your actual audience is, who the community you're serving actually is, and what the product looks and feels like, what the format is, what the frequency is, what the style is what the uh, workflow is for creating that on a regular basis and developing it. You'll also think about how to grow the community. So you need an audience for something to succeed or a community of people who are engaging with what you're doing and will help you think through how do you actually grow that community from zero or one to 10, then 100, then 1,000. And you'll hear from the alums who have already been actually doing that in, in, the, in the period um, during the program and after the program. And then finally, most importantly, perhaps, Think through how you're actually going to sustain yourself. This is arguably the most difficult thing in the in the ecosystem that we're in, um, uh, because the ecosystem has changed so much and the the uh, monetization methodology has changed so much. So we'll give you a bunch of different tools and approaches, some inspiration, some ideas, some resources that will help you start to think through your revenue portfolio. What are the different ways that you could actually make your project sustainable? How could you actually make money on this so you can pay your rent? pay for food, support your family, do the work you want to do, and do uh, do the work of maintaining a quality journalism project over time. And we do this through a, a couple of different methods. Um, so as you're building your project, as you're um, thinking through the growth strategy and thinking through the monetization strategy, you're also collaborating with colleagues and you're working with a mentor. And you are thinking through in the real world, how can you apply these things we're talking about in these live sessions, in these workshops, in these discussions online, how can you apply them in your actual project? And then you're bringing your, your results back and you're saying, well, I tried this, I'm thinking about that. How might I do it? How might I execute it in this context? You're getting feedback from colleagues, from people in the cohort, from the instructors, from your mentor, et cetera, from coaches. And you're applying again and you're iterating. And we don't claim to have answers for everyone about everything because each person's project is different. Each culture is different. Each context is different. Your experience is different from someone else. But we will give you examples of what other people have done. We will give you resources and tools and templates and ideas and an opportunity to practice. And we will give you feedback. And that's what really adds up to an experience that we think is really helpful in guiding people forward on their ventures. In practical, specific terms, there are three basic things that you do in the program. First, you attend live sessions twice a week, Tuesday, Thursday, 10 a.m. Eastern time to noon Eastern time. You can calculate that in whatever time zone you're in. I know people are coming from a lot of different parts of the world. Some people join us in the nighttime where they are, some people in the early morning, um, but it's 10 a.m. to 12 p.m., so two-hour sessions live twice a week, Tuesdays and Thursdays. Then there's anytime learning, as we call it, which is to say opportunities to watch videos, read, engage with one another, um, think through um, studies, examples, templates that we've given in live sessions on your own time, flexibly. And then finally, applying those things, as I mentioned, to your own project. And that happens as the program progresses, as you build your own venture, as you experiment, as you try out creating something, as you try out having meetings with potential clients or partners. Um, those are the project-based learning things where you're actually putting things into practice in the real world. And so that's essentially the, the commitment that you make in being part of a pro this kind of program is that live time and then that that flexible um, component. And it adds up to about a full day of, of work, a full day of commitment, um, some of which is at designated times, um, those two-hour learning blocks, and some of which is flexible according to your needs and your schedule. This is a selection of our teaching team, an all-star teaching team. These are people who are practitioners, who are phenomenally enthusiastic about the subject they teach. They have enthusiasm, they have experience teaching and doing what they do, and they have expertise. They know a lot about the subject matter, whether it's whether it's um, building a community, whether it's building a product, whether it's monetizing uh, something, whether it's leading something, whether it's finding balance in your own life. These are people who have a lot of experience, a lot of expertise, and have taught with us before and have shaped their own knowledge into something that they can transfer to other people, that they can communicate enthusiastically. And our sessions are not lectures. Some of them incorporate some lecture components, but there's workshop components, there's activities, there's discussions, they're interactive, 
in the way that they're designed so that they're engaging and they're fun, I think. Um, at least I, I have fun. I don't know. We can hear from the alums if they find them to be fun or some of them were more fun than others. Um, but, but the idea is that these are active and engaging. These are not lectures uh, for the most part. Lots of people have applied to be part of the program, and that's given us the luxury of putting together amazing cohorts that we're really proud of and that have done amazing things. The uh, people in the first seven cohorts, as I said, have come from all over the world. Um, and this is actually the, the number of people who have been selected. You see, I see I see Timmy's picture uh, prominently here um, and maybe others um, that you'll hear from today here as well in this picture. Um, more than 45 countries have been represented. Um, people have been really satisfied with the program. We, we invite people to share their feedback um, repeatedly throughout the program and after each cohort and we make adjustments and we've continually worked to refine the program to make it as effective and engaging and impactful as possible. And as a result, people have responded and uh, and have found the experience to be valuable, at least as, as far as the feedback has, has gone, which we think um, reflects uh, our efforts to, to make it really impactful and really relevant for, for people. Um, and I wanna give you a sense of what some of the projects are uh, before we turn it over to the, the alums. Um, and you can hear more from them about their experience. Uh, this is uh, uh, an assortment of projects. These are not the most, just the most successful projects or just the most famous projects or just the most interesting projects from my perspective. They're, they're really uh, uh, an assemblage of a variety of different kinds of projects, just to give you a flavor for the kinds of things people create. This is a project by Claudia Jardim from Brazil. And she was working on a, as you can see, a, pro a project, project a podcast about modern slavery, which is something that we think are may have thought, some of us may have thought that this was something of the past, a historical phenomenon, but as Claudia's podcast demonstrates, this is very much uh, a real phenomenon in the, in the modern era um, with trafficked workers. And, and uh, she has been working on this podcast for quite some time. And in the course of the program, refined the idea, found partners, thought about growth strategy, developed some revenue approaches to make this into a reality and to make it more impactful than it might otherwise have been. And she was based in Thailand, actually, during the program. So people, as I said, are in all parts of the world. Uh, this is a, a project by a journalist focused on the Native American community in Minnesota, specifically. And um, the Wisdom Continuum is part of a community building effort that includes not just the podcast, but other kinds of content and events. Subtitle is another podcast. So these are three kind of podcasts, just to give you an example. This is a fantastic podcast about language, by the way, um, which has done really well at generating revenue from grants. So many of the projects uh, in the program have generated money from subscriptions, from sponsorships, from all sorts of different revenue streams, um, variety of products. Um, but in some cases, they also have generated revenue from, from grants. And, and Patrick Cox's subtitle podcast about language uh, has been really successful at generating uh, grant or earning grants. Uh, another project that has earned a significant amount in grants, in fact, a five-year major grant, um, Kristen's project here, um, and another podcast that's also a newsletter. Now we're moving into a few newsletters. Geneva Health Files, one of the most, um, one of the most uh, high, highly revenue generating international newsletters on Substack, um, paid newsletter. It's done really well. Geneva Health Files um, by Prithi Patnaik, focused on global health. This is the food section, more of a local and regional food um, paid newsletter on Substack, also done really well, Hannah Raskin and won awards for the journalism um, and also done really well at generating uh, some sustainable revenue streams. This is a newsletter from, from India. This propelled uh, this project propelled the creator, Rayan, to uh, a whole series of different international opportunities that, that he's had. And this is a reflection to me of the fact that Success is measured in different ways by different people. Sometimes it's revenue, sometimes it's growth, sometimes it's having an award-winning, impactful, journalistically valuable product that you create, but sometimes it's other things. It's taking a career in new directions. Um, I just spoke with an alum uh, yesterday, actually, who now works at Apple. He had worked on a VR startup years ago. Things um, that emerge in this program lead people in all sorts of interesting and exciting directions for them. And sometimes, again, it's the product itself thriving. Sometimes it's someone in, in the cohort that they meet or a network that they meet that leads them um, forward in a new direction or, or new partnership. So there's all sorts of ways of succeeding and growing. And we ultimately defer to, to you as the people who are building your own ventures to determine your own measures of, of success and progress. Um, lots of different kinds of sites. Um, this is from a European uh, participant focused on um, Black communities throughout Europe and around the world. This is a project by Tanmoy 
um, focused on, as you can see, uh, mental health storytelling and a really interesting and novel approach to community building has done really well, grown a big community, uh, generated significant revenue and contributed really important dialogue on this subject matter. Black Women Photographers is an amazing community. Those of you who are aware of it will know this is a couple thousand people who are regularly part of the active part of this community, um, Black women photographers who are part of the community. And it's a community, it's a site, it's a resource, it's a hub, it's a network, it has all sorts of different components. And that also is a reflection of the fact that projects that emerge in the Entrepreneurial Journalism Creators Program aren't all the same shape or size or format or type. This is kind of a cross uh, formats, across types, it's a community, it's, it's, it's a website, it's a variety of different things. And we are open to lots of different kinds of projects because we think, I think, and we think as a community, as a staff, that we need different kinds of innovation, different kinds of projects to take the journalism ecosystem in new directions and to try new experiments. Uh, this is a old fashioned B2B kind of publication or, or a niche industry kind of publication, Weed Week focused on cannabis, um, uh, uh, an area that's grown in interest and there's all sorts of topics related to that that have been um, covered in this newsletter um, this one is is uh, disability news lens 15 is created by um an alum who by a participant in the program who felt that there was an opportunity to focus on a range of stories affecting people with various different kinds of disabilities or different abilities and creating accessible content and has a variety of different components including content including services this is focused on the early days of life. Uh, this is technology policy, all sorts of different topics that people have focused on. So that gives you hopefully a little window, a little picture into the kinds of things people create in the program. And in a moment, we'll we'll hear from the, the four alums who are here. Um, and you'll hear, I think, or you'll get a sense uh, of, of what the experience is like um, from them. But um, one of the things we tried to encourage people to do throughout the program is to engage in these challenges, right? Try new things, new tactics to strengthen their product, to grow the community, to consider new approaches to monetization, to discuss that with other folks. We give lots of examples. We give you frameworks for applying these ideas, for organizing your approach and the many different kinds of things we all have to do as entrepreneurs, as creators. And we give you some guidance. We will not give you all the answers. We don't have all the answers. Um, we will not tell you what to do. We'll give you some ideas and some options, give you some feedback, um, serve as a sounding board, encourage you to meet certain people who might have input, et cetera. Um, and, and as I said, the takeaway, the outcome, if you commit to the program, if you're accepted to the program, you commit to the program, you participate actively and, and thrive in the program, you will have a valuable product at some stage, right, depending on where you're at to come in with, you'll be at some stage advanced from that. By the end of the 100 days, you'll have some um, outreach and growth process in place in progress, hopefully, and you'll have a revenue portfolio either in development or actually implemented. And there's a lot of different ways in which this program is different from others. I, I think you've probably already got a sense of some of that. These are active practitioners who you're learning from. They're not theoreticians or academicians. There's an amazing cohort from around the world that you're part of. Very few programs have as global a cohort, I think, as we do, or as diverse a cohort as we typically do. The learning is very flexible, so you can adapt it to your own needs and your own learning styles and your own preferences. Um, the curriculum is changing constantly. We hear from people in the field who are doing the work right now as it's happening, as the platforms are changing, as the monetization methods are changing. We give you personal attention, which you don't get in a larger kind of MOOC or a an impersonal kind of um, program. So lots of ways in which we think this is, is unique. If you're interested in this, if this makes sense to you um, or this resonates with you, um, there's a, a simple next step, which is to fill out the application. Um, as I said, it's pretty straightforward. People often can do it in a relatively short amount of time, no tests, no costs, um, no references required. It's, we try to keep it as simple as, as possible. We've all been through arduous hoop jumping processes and form filling bureaucracies, and we are more about the idea and actually um, your strengths. Um, so that's that's why we keep it as simple and straightforward and streamlined as possible. Basically, we wanna know what you've done in the past and what you're aiming to do in the future. That's basically the bottom line. 
And we ask you to do that in text form and, short, and share a little video just because we find that people's enthusiasm and their passion and their specificity comes through helpfully in, in a short video. Um, but it's not about production value. It's not about doing anything fancy. It's just about talking to a, a camera and we give you some guidance in the application and, and how to do that. And if you have scholarship need, you can indicate that in the application. There's no separate application. It's right in the same application. Um, and there are some people who have the, the wherewithal to cover the relatively um, modest cost of the tuition. And I say relatively modest relative to an MBA program, uh, which can be $100,000 or a full year um, MA program, which can be $50,000. Um, our program is $4,000, um, which is modest for some, but uh, but arduous for others. And so for those for whom that presents a financial challenge, um, there's a scholarship opportunity we have, which is um, which is limited because we rely on, on external support for that. Um, but those who do have need should indicate that. And to the extent we have scholarships to offer, we are eager to offer them to those who need it. And then a few weeks after that, we'll respond to you. And if you're accepted, you'll meet your cohort in March. Um, we begin um, onboarding you before the, the first day, which is March 18th. And then we wrap up in, in June. And that's the, the gist of it. Um, and we hope that if this is relevant for you and meaningful for you and resonates with you, that you'll join us um, because we have seen what your predecessors have built and we are excited about what you will build. Um, so I wanna take a couple minutes for questions and then I'm gonna turn it right over to our alums so you can hear a little bit from them. And uh, Kyle, feel free to help me here if there's a particular question you've seen in the chat um, to let me know. Otherwise, if people have a question, you wanna put your hand up, your digital hand up, um, put your hand up if you've got a quick, concise question, a clarification question, something you want to clarify or follow up on. Um, we can take a couple of those quickly now. And otherwise, I'll see if there's something in the chat that's that is pressing. I think, I think I covered a lot of it there. Uh, okay. <laughs> okay. So if you do have questions along the way, um, further as we progress, continue feeling free to add them. I see Golda has a question. Mm -hmm. Hi, hi there, Jeremy. Hi. Um, hi. I had a really quick question about um, mentors and sure. kind of what are the worlds that your mentors come from? Sure. Yeah. So they come from a variety of different kinds of backgrounds, um, and we also we want them to have to have a few different skill sets because the kinds of things people need oftentimes are multi layered. So someone might need some guidance in terms of some monetization ideas. And so we want people who can speak to that, but also people who have made their own product or launched something and understand that there's a variety of different things from you know recruiting potential team members or partners to, again, thinking about life balance. Um, um, uh, multiple of our, of our mentors, for example, are people who are juggling, you know, managing a family at home and have personal responsibilities. Um, as moms and dads, but also are entrepreneurs and also have worked in a company and know what that's like to start something as a side project, for example, and then build it into its own independent venture. So um, there are a variety, variety of different expertise, people who have had experience in different parts of the world, because as I mentioned, participants have come from more than 45 different countries. So we want people who can speak to international um, issues. In fact, Timmy, who's here, has been a mentor and, and um, can speak to that part of the experience as well. Um, so yeah, so multiple different kinds of ex experience, personal and professional, multiple areas of expertise. We also find it important for people to be able to listen. So there's some people who like to coach, but they mainly like to hear themselves talk. And I find the best mentors are those who are also really good at listening and really understanding what someone's need is. So our mentors are also focused on being really good listeners and sounding boards and not necessarily providing answers. You know, some people think that a mentor's role or coach's role is to answer the questions. And certainly there are some questions that can be answered by a mentor, but many of the questions that could be answered directly or simply um, are things you could Google or find out factual kinds of information or resources. The, the things that are actually often most helpful for mentors and coaches, and those of you who have had a great mentor or coach can probably relate to this, are the pointed questions or the way in which they get you to think about something from a different perspective so that you come up with your own answer as opposed to them telling you what they think you should do or what they, you know, what their experience was. Um, so those are, those are a few thoughts. Uh, Mike, uh, maybe we'll take one more, um, now and then, and then we'll, we'll get to some others later. Mike, I think you may need to unmute. Can't hear you. Maybe uh, an audio setting 
issue. Um, maybe type in the in the chat or 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 um or fix the audio and we'll we'll get back to you later if that's okay, Mike. Um, okay, so um, in service of getting to the the uh, alums as quickly as possible, um, I want to introduce them. So I'm not going to say much about them because you can read about them and you'll hear about them momentarily. But I'll just say a couple of words. Um, Flavian uh, created Spinning Forward. It's already won awards from Lion. It's uh, a really focused, well tailored project, as you can see on the screen, for creators of color in Toronto specifically. And Flavian is someone who's bringing a wealth of professional experience to this project and crafted it really thoughtfully and carefully. And you'll hear from him about how he did that, why he decided to take part in a program when he already had a lot of professional experience. Um, Tim created Tim Donnelly created the New York Groove um, this year. And I've been really excited as a New Yorker to see something really great in the news ecosystem around New York City as a local resident. Um, there's a lot of publications in New York City as, as a media capital. Um, that it is, but but local content and creative local content of the kind that, that Tim has has led at the New York Groove is, is really great. And it's been exciting to see that project emerge from an idea, just an idea, something they thought was a need in the market to something they've actually brought into practice. So that's really, really exciting. And, and this is a good example of how projects can be local, they can be topical, um, they also can be um, addressing a certain demographic. Um, so, so there's a lot of different kinds of ways to, to slice a product, and you can hear from Tim more about that. Uh, Query is also an incredible project from Encore, again, a different part of the world, um, in this case in India, and addressing an underserved community. A lot of the projects in the Entrepreneurial Journalism Creators Program, I find, are addressing communities that haven't adequately been served for a variety of different reasons, um, and, and sometimes have been left out of coverage by mainstream media or, or just have been shunted to the side. And, and this is a really great example of a project that's also focused on in-depth content, in-depth storytelling. So there's a range on the spectrum of news that's happening daily, quick stories, service content. And then there's also in-depth, really deep storytelling, right? And that's where this kind of project, uh, Queer Beat, shines. And you can hear from Ankur about, about that. Mm -hmm. And then finally, uh, Foolish Careers. I love this project by Timmy um, because it's so distinct. It's so original, it's beautifully designed, right? Design is a hugely important part of entrepreneurship in my view. And this is a great example of a project that's beautifully designed and also award-winning um, uh, at the at the um, Splice um, conference. Uh, Timmy won some funding um, among, other, among other accolades. And also an example of someone, um, Timmy is, is an example of someone who like many of us has multiple different things we juggle. We have a professional thing that may be our main gig and we may have a side gig, or we may have two different gigs. We may balance them in different ways. And the reality is, we may um, we may envision doing only one thing all the time. But the reality is, many of us have portfolio careers of various kinds. And not only does Timmy kind of cover people who have those creative kind of foolish careers or creative careers in in uh, in Asia, but she also, in fact, embodies that. At least from my perspective, Timmy, you can you can disagree with that if that's not right. But but she also has a really um, exciting job in terms of um, the podcast world, in addition to having her own venture. So and in, and in addition to serving now as a mentor in our program. So um, lots of different things each of the four of them can bring to us. And and um, because I just ended with Timmy, let me kick it off to Timmy now to just share um, first maybe why did you take part in a program like this? You already had professional experience. Um, there are a lot of things you could spend time on. Why why did you decide to take part in a program like this one? And and what were a couple of the the key takeaways that might be useful for people to know about? Yeah, I I joined the program. I applied to the program because I was I actually had this idea. I didn't have the name yet, but I had the idea for this uh creative kind of coverage of the creative industries in Asia for a long time. And I had actually brought it to another incubator but that incubator was a tech incubator and they really had no clue i mean honestly like i've worked in tech media and you tech does not have a clue about how to do media startups so it was very frustrating um but also covid had hit and uh, you know like there's the saying that you really i i knew that if i didn't get anything like this started during covid i would never do it because i would never have had as much time as i did then so I remember actually when when I attended the open house like this, the question I asked you was, well, I'm not a journalist. I ha I am in digital media. I have like a lot of experience, in, but always on the business side. And so that kind of gave me this imposter syndrome about um, whether I could I could participate in a course like this. And but, you know, I submitted like Jeremy says, just submit. 
uh, and I did, and I got into that wonderful 2020, October 2020 cohort. Um, yeah, and the I guess the biggest takeaway, um, which Jeremy alluded to, is I didn't know coming in whether I would have a project coming out of it, but I did. Um, I, I launched Foolish Careers actually in the last week of the program. Um, and it is it went on for a while. It's now on hiatus. It did win a couple of um, prizes, which we've kept in an interest-bearing bank account while we reboot. Um, actually, I put it in the stock market, so now it's doing well, that prize money. Um, so we have it there while we're figuring out how to reboot this thing. Uh, but the what came out of it were a few things, actually. Um, I did end up getting the portfolio career I wanted. I do have a... I now have a new day job. I Well, out of it, I got a new day job, which now let me, lets me work with podcasters around the region. Uh, and, you know, that helped me with my personal and professional goal of just still being in digital media, but being closer to the creative and the editorial side of it. Um, and then, yeah, and then just kind of kept Foolish Careers going. Um, the biggest thing I also learned was that uh, you, you really don't know how the project will go, but as long as you have something out in the world, things will come. And that's what I've seen kind of in the last 12 months, which we can talk about later um, when we get to that. So yeah, so my biggest takeaways were if you if you really already have something that you're doing or want to do in this field, then joining this 100-day program is definitely going to help give you the structure that it gave. That's what it gave me to really think through things properly and actually make yourself launch something because you're surrounded by a cohort who's very encouraging and very supportive and very constructive. Thank you, Timmy. Um, I want to turn to maybe Ankur um, next. I think I'm going in reverse order. So Ankur, um, what, what, what drew you to this program? Um, again, lots of programs around the world you could do, a lot of things you could do. Um, you already had experience. What, why did you decide to take part in this program? And what were some of the key takeaways for, for you? Right. So when I was thinking of applying to the, pro uh, to the program, I was at a stage in my career where uh, uh, I was thinking about what's next for me. I had traveled across Sub-Saharan Africa, South Asia, travel, uh, doing a lots of important stories. They were winning awards. I was in some sense uh, uh, doing well as a, a freelance journalist. Um, but I felt that there is probably something that I can uniquely do. Uh, and what that uh, uh, would be. And I, as I thought more, um, this question of uh, uh, underreporting and misreporting of LGBTQ uh, communities in India kept coming up. Uh, but because I was, I was a freelance journalist, I had zero idea, no idea, complete blank slate about how to do this how to run a, a media business, what does it entail, from where the money comes, who the audience are, how to figure that out, all the questions that can that you can possibly think of. So uh, with all those multiple questions in mind, I thought that let's mm -hmm. uh, jump to this program. Uh, the time frame really appealed to me. Uh, because It's not one week uh, where you can't understand all these things. I could not give it one focused year because I had other freelance projects going on. So this just seemed like a right opportunity, a time frame, a flexible uh, um, platform to understand these things. And uh, I'll sort of detail later uh, what exactly I learned, but biggest thing it gives you is clarity. Over and over when you uh, come to the sessions and speak to the mentors and the community, you, you get, you gain clarity. And that, that's really the biggest uh, um, learning for you. Thanks, Ankur. Um, Tim. Yeah, hi, everyone. Good to see everybody. Uh, so um, I had this idea for this project that we ended up doing called the New York Groove, and uh, it had been running around in my head for um, maybe two years at that point. And um, so it ended up applying to this program because I needed a little bit of guide rails in terms of how to actually turn it into a thing. And I went to journalism school like a hundred years ago in relative journalism time. So my ideas about like what makes a good publication are maybe a little bit outdated. Um, and I'm sure like many of you, I have tons of 
um, writing experience and tons of writing skill and a billion story ideas, but um, the actual financial and management side of it was what was eluding me. So that's kind of what led me to the program in terms of um, getting that idea whipped into shape and not just doing it like off the top of my head of what I thought was going to be the right ideas. And, um, and that is basically what I got out of it. Um, still working on the financial parts of it, of course, but um, kind of putting, putting everything that I had into perspective and um, also getting um, a lot of motivation and inspiration from everybody else, which is truly invaluable just to spend 100 days with people around the world and talk about all these different passionate local journalism projects. So it really inspired me. Um, and, it, and I hope I inspired some other people, but and that was a great part of, of being part of the program that I didn't even know would be part of it when I applied. Yeah, I'm glad you mentioned that. that I think for me, one that's one of the, the takeaways from the online component. You know, one of the questions, one of the question marks we had when, you know, converting to, from an in-person program to a to an online program was what what is that how does that impact the community building element or how how well will people get to know each other or how much will people feel a part of a cohort when they're not seeing each other in person in the hallway you know or having a beer afterwards um and i've been surprised that actually people still manage to develop relationships and, and collaborations I, I would say there's a difference right i don't think it would be honest to say it's the exact same thing it's not um being in person with people for for a semester is a different level of contact, right? So I, I wouldn't claim that it's not. Um, but uh, despite that, the fact of repeatedly engaging with people in the ways that we do in the program, I think it seems that uh, at least for many people, there are um, relationships that develop or inspiration that happens, um, ideas that transfer across in ways that um, that don't necessarily require that you're in person, that you actually can still maintain, you know, develop that relationship over time and get to know each other. Um, in the course of the the cohort, um, Flavian, what about you? What what was your impetus for for joining this, and what was what, what were a couple of the the key takeaways for you? Thanks very much for the invite, because I was um, sitting in in the participants' uh, shoes exactly a year ago. I think with Tim, we we're in the same cohort, and one of the questions I asked that Jeremy answered that you answered, Jeremy, um, in this particular open house. Uh, put me over the edge because it was really important to me. I, I, you know, one of the big challenges when you do something like this is is the fact that it is really, really lonely. You're doing it by yourself, and you're often doing it in your head. And I needed a way to get out of my head during the program. And Jeremy, I asked you what happens the day after the program ends, and and you had a great answer. And it's true, this alumni network is really active and alive if i reach out to someone i, I get a response it, it's not it's it's not crickets and and that was really important because it's hard to it's hard to build anything um, by yourself and the other thing is this program i don't know what word to describe it i think timmy alluded to it um tech incubators or tech these tech things they're, they're cold they really are. They're cold and they're 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 a little uh, uh, bumpy. Uh, this one, it, it's kind. It's gentle, and it thinks about your your um, self care. It thinks about it from the point of view of the community. And and I was able to ping people throughout the program and talk. And and that included the staff. You know, it's 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 often underestimated. There's mentors. There's instructors. There's also Jeremy's team, Kyle, Jeremy, and, and um, um, I'm forgetting her name now. Um, Jeremy, help me. Umbreen. Mm -hmm. Umbreen, yeah. Um, they're like, I call them the dream team because they can sense when you're off. They can sense when you might need a pickup. And people need pickups in this program because it's a lot of work. And the other thing is, you just don't know what you don't know until you see it spread out in this curriculum. And then you just get exposed to these worldwide experts in a global program. It's it's hard to beat that type of care that you get from start to finish. And that somehow they manage to find ways to continue it after. I mean, it, it's, 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 it's really special the, the, the way this thing is designed. And, and I give Jeremy some credit because it's hard to do this on Zoom, and and there is a creative um, 
aspect. You saw the slides, right? You know, we learned that that particular software that Jeremy used uh, in the pitches, and and uh, uh, that that's something to be taken seriously. That that there's a there's a aesthetic that you you don't feel that you're you're in a Zoom box. You know, you, you feel you're talking to people. And I don't know. I, I haven't yet figured out how you guys do that, to be honest, because I haven't seen it in many places. Thanks, Flavin, for that. Um, I, yeah, I, I want to circle back to the point about isolation. I do feel, I mean, I certainly felt that personally at the beginning of the pandemic. We were, we had yet to launch this program, um, but I was feeling very isolated. I mean, many of us were, of course, of course around the world. Um, and and I do think that being part of a cohort um, can make a difference with that, like can really give you a sense that, yeah, there's some other people along this journey um, their project may be different. They may be in a different country or at a different stage of the project or of their career, but they uh, can relate to the challenges you face along the way. They can give you some ideas or inspiration. They can congratulate you on your progress, or they can, you know, give you uh, courage to try something you're you're afraid to try, etc. Um, I want to give you a chance to each just summarize briefly the project itself. Um, I, I kind of introduced it briefly with the slide, but like, just give us an idea of what what the value prop what, what was the problem you were solving or what was the the um, the hole you're trying to fill and and um and what's one thing you realized about that maybe in in 2023 um sort of open ended there so so give us a quick quick summary of what the project is and maybe one one thing about it that's been evolving or changing or developing or growing in in 2023 um into into this new year um um if you if you could share that maybe we'll go back in the, the reverse order now again so Flavian if I can turn to you first uh what's the what's the pro who is the project serving what's the, what's the main kind of uh, objective you have and, and I, was, I was i was really interested in in um, this this um creator economy all these young people who who are sort of changing their their path from traditional careers to sort of these online content creators and i had a hunch that it might not be equal similar to what happens in the real world so i i wanted to cover people of color indigenous black and indigenous people of color uh, in the 16 to 34 age group um, in the Toronto area. Uh, I thought I was going to do Toronto, but I couldn't because guess what? People of color, they don't live in downtown Toronto. It's too expensive. So I had to kind of expand the coverage to neighboring cities uh, or the, the region. And I wanted just to understand, is it fair? It, because they just get online and they think, oh, if I create content, it's going to it's going to happen. It isn't fair. There's a whole bunch of stuff around the algorithm bias and, and uh, um, um, the racial pay gap that I cover and all this stuff that, that is underneath and most of these creators don't even know that, that they're at a disadvantage and how do you kind of help them navigate and, and talk about that. I didn't realize that, that uh, there were just so many in, in Toronto that were trying to do this and I found out from teachers at colleges and universities, I found out from mothers started contacting me saying, why is my kid who's got this $50,000 education wanting to become a content creator? Um, and what is it? Is it is it legit? And so I started talking to these people who know the content creators, because guess what? The content creators don't talk to their parents. They don't talk to their teachers because they think they're going to get in trouble. They think there's, you know, so they talk to me and they they've even asked me, when should I tell my parents? When should I? And so that led to partnerships with, um, you know, universities, high school boards of education and uh, colleges as well, where they approached me. And, you know, we don't know what to do because we can't have this kind of dropout type, type thing. And so it's becoming a, sort of an educational thing as well. Um, you know, the government just approached me because they, 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 they're not aware of this space. Uh, and again, they really want to know. I'm approaching employers now because you know the, the, they need to they need happy employers employees and and most of the employees will still be employees and they do this on the side because it takes time and they're not sure if they want to do it full time but it's kind of a dynamic world that that and the other thing I realized was civic and sort of civic engagement among young people is actually something they want to do they just don't feel invited to the so, so it's an area that I'm covering because, uh, I mean, I just covered somebody who takes four to five hours per, per night to travel to, to Toronto to, to, to perform. And he, he, you know, 
he, he really wants uh, uh, transportation improved in, in this city. So they really care about civic engagement. They just don't know that they're included. They feel very tokenized in their jobs, you know, people of color. And so um, it's a big learning curve for, for, for myself as well. And I like to be challenged figuring things out and, and as well as for the audience. I think it's interesting you mentioned about partnerships. I think that's one of the key things that I've realized in running my own newsletter is the importance of like the parts of it that intersect with other, either other writers, other partners, other clients, et cetera, other collaborating organizations. Um, uh, and, and just to reflect back one other thing about the alumni thing, that is an increasingly important part of it for us, right? 100 days is a good amount of time, we think, in the sense that it's not just a week, Ankara, like you mentioned, right? It's it's more than that, right? It's, we can get into more depth than we could in a day or a week. Um, but it's also not a year. It's also not two years, right? It's not this huge thing that's going to be a deep commitment for a long period of time. So we think 100 days is a good amount of time. But we also recognize that it takes a couple of years in some cases, right? Or it takes a couple iterations or a couple of seasons. Or um, as, as Timmy mentioned, it takes it, you know, putting it on the side for a while, coming back to it in some cases, so, so that's why the alumni thing is really important for us. And now we've got several hundred people who have been through the program, like like the four of you and many others. And so we're increasingly putting some effort and thought into, okay, how can we be useful to people and help people connect with one another after they've been through one of the programs? And that's something we we intend to do more and more of. And that's, I think, another benefit of being part of the program is then you are then part of this community for for years thereafter. You, you, may, you may not be involved with that in a daily basis, you know, after that, but um, but certainly periodically when it's when it's relevant for you. Um, Tim, uh, give us a quick and and for time's sake, I'm going to ask you all to to be brief on this um, this next question so we can get, get some some Q and A um, from others. Um, but Tim, tell us about New York Groove and and what's one big learning so far in the launch period. You've you've recently hit a milestone, which was great, right? And um, and tried a couple things. Um, just give us a little update on on the hole you were filling in New York City, which is a big media city, and and one of the the developments recently. Yeah, so the New York Group is a weekly service journalism focused newsletter uh, designed to help everyone be a better New Yorker, both in being more engaged and understanding the city more and having more fun um, and learning about things to do and whatnot. Um, the hole we were filling is kind of that local news that's a bit crumbled here uh, lately in the past couple of years. There's a lot of media here, but it's often a nationally focused, and we're missing a lot of the street level kind of like regular everyday stories. And also, people are just confused about things that are happening, how to go about doing things, you know, how to um, manage basic things in the city sometimes. So we have a lot of explainers and a lot of guides and um, things along those lines. Um, one of the things we've learned is that uh, we put a lot of faith in our just, just opening up our membership program right away to get income. And that really worked out really well so far. Um, I think the, the milestone you were thinking about is um, that we crossed over um ten thousand dollars in annual revenue pretty quickly which was which was great to see um it's not by any means a full-time job yet but uh, i hope it would be soon and uh yeah and then we learned that people just love um like they love like learning more about the city things they didn't know about before um and they miss kind of just the simple stuff like stuff to do why does this why does this thing work this way why does it not work this way um, and we've gotten really good um, responses on that. And then our, our top story of the year, of our first year, was um, about like helping asylum seekers. Um, people were really interested in going out and like, how do I help this crisis that's going on in New York City? For anybody who doesn't know, we're having a major um, crisis of, of migrants and asylum seekers who have, who have kind of taken um, taken to the city. So um, yeah, so we're going to keep doing stuff like that. And um, Another thing I learned in the program that I should uh, worth mentioning is that it is okay to start small um, to get kind of a minimum thing out there, that, which is why we're doing a weekly newsletter for now and, and would like to grow from there. And um, don't don't be shy about asking people for money because uh, give give people a chance to pay you um, was a very important thing we learned, which I um, has definitely paid off so far. Thanks, Tim. Um, uh, Ankar. Um, tell us about the gap you're filling and and kind of a learning um, from 2023 and and as you've been working on the venture. Sure, sure. So uh, Queerbeat is a collaborative journalism venture that really helps fill a historical gap of accurate and diverse stories in the Indian me media ecosystem about LGBTQ communities. Uh, because I, I mean, being a queer person, I realized that the stories that were already there um, were actually harming the community 
uh, and also just the larger society because it was there's so much inaccurate information about the LGBTQ community in India. So our goal is to put out accurate stories and also uh, diverse kind of stories because what was there also is it's just very repetitive uh, kind of uh, very stereotypical coverage of LGBTQ communities. We Our stories serve two primary uh, goals. One is to really um, uh, enhance the well-being of LGBTQ communities when they engage with these stories and also reduce uh, the societal biases that exist uh, um, uh, in, the, in the Indian culture. Uh, this uh, uh, in 2023, uh, I did more panels than I did in my 13 years of careers before <laughs> before starting Queer Beat because everybody uh, in India and just largely in global south when they sort of heard of Queer Beat, uh, it's it's an idea that nobody, very few people have actually experimented with or looked at this community. Uh, so it was an opportunity to talk to a lot of. Uh, uh, media ecosystems in different countries about how something like this can be done, why it is so uh, useful. Another thing uh, very quickly what I learned uh, this year is to uh, not fall in love with your solution of the problem, keeping the problem in mind, uh, because there are different kinds of uh, uh, solutions like uh, we do long form content. Uh, but as uh, communities, sorry, my dog is going crazy now. You must be uh, hearing. People have asked for uh, explainers, different kind of uh, uh, resources. Like, uh, is my dog bothering too much? Can you hear me? No. Okay. It's <laughs> yeah. fine. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. 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 So. Um, like, like our uh, audience uh, told us that they would like more explain explainers from us. They would also uh, like us to create resources like uh, a list of mental health professionals, uh, not just stories. So there is a demand that uh, uh, we are thinking about how to uh, sort of like the diverse kinds of things that our audience is asking us, not just stories. So we are thinking about all of that, how to solve the problem. That's it. Thanks, Ankur. Uh, so, Timmy, um, I think you're the last one on this question, and then I'm going to take a few moments uh, to answer a couple of questions that have been in the chat, and then to open up for any final questions uh, in, in the last few minutes here. Uh, yes. So, Foolish Careers is, it came out of the need to, I was really annoyed that creative careers were not taken as seriously as other types of careers, and especially in Asia. I'm based in Singapore. You know, it's really seen as like a second tier type of job and you know an Asian your your parents will tell you why don't you get a more sensible career like being a lawyer a doctor or whatever and so that's how the title came came out of it actually and I just wanted to cover it and report on it the way you would you know report on any other industry but also take it out of the fluffy kind of lifestyle pages of, of a newsletter and of a, of a, of a newspaper uh, and actually get into you know the messy middle of how these careers and businesses are built. And so the interview series that um, Foolish Careers is based on does that. And it's mainly a newsletter, um, which uh, is still growing, uh, although slowly because we're not publishing. Um, and so that will continue to be the core of it. Um, and the biggest thing, the other thing that, uh, uh, that it will start to offer are uh, kind of community get togethers because people have asked for that. Um, and that's where actually a lot of the collaboration opportunities have come in because there have been people who have heard about it or people we've interviewed who actually are in the industry and want to actually participate, host communities, uh, host sessions. So it's kind of becoming this little kind of fly wheel in a way. Yeah. And so the biggest thing I learned was that you really had, I really had to shed my own limiting beliefs on how to generate revenue, which is really ironic because I do come from like the business side of publishing where I understand sales, marketing, how you make money. And I really had to shed kind of those traditional, uh, yeah, the traditional way of thinking and just be open to how uh, this would kind of just make money directly and indirectly. Thanks, Timmy. Um, these are all really fascinating projects, and and I think they they show the 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 nature, the evolving nature of the ecosystem, right? Which which 
allows for and in fact requires projects that have multiple components, right? Like Anker, Anker mentioning the different kinds of products or, or kind of solutions that the audience was kind of asking for, right? Tim recognizing that people want service journals and they want it to be fun, but also to be useful. And it might be about volunteering, but it might also be about arts and culture. Uh, and in Timmy's case, you know, there might be different kinds of components and and there might be events in the future, right? Um, uh, that Timmy has talked about and, and different kinds of ways of engaging with the, with the community. Uh, in the last few minutes we have here, I want to see if we can address a few of the questions. We also have an open line through our email, ejcp at journalism.cuny.edu. If you have questions that don't get resolved today or you're curious about something and don't want to raise it here, um, you should feel free to, to write to us. We are responsive. Um, one of the questions that came up uh, was about... Uh, let me see how it's worded here. Um, monetizing in other parts of the world. So we we have a range of alums now who have been um, participants in the program from various parts of the world. And so one of the things we can encourage you to do and connect you to is people who have been in your shoes in a particular part of the world. So that can be helpful. We can't claim to have answers about monetization in every part of the world. Um, we can give you sources of inspiration, sources of insight, examples, frameworks, tools, ideas, questions to consider, experiments to try. And those are the things that you can then, as a participant, transform into practical steps. So anyone who claims to know exactly what the approach is that will work for you is um, not being fully candid, right? Because they can't know. Um, because it depends on your context, on your specific skill set, on your specific network, or your specific time availability, and a whole range of other factors. Um, there's a question also about what's the balance between showing students how to set up and run a business versus how to create a marketable product. So the way I think about this is, and I think the way we structure the program is first thinking about what the problem you're serve, solving is or what community you're addressing and how you're serving that community, what kind of product you're actually creating. Because without having a product, and by product, we mean a newsletter, a podcast, a niche site, uh, some other kind of product that's serving people. Without having that, all the other stuff is, is really irrelevant. So you don't need to, I mean, whether or not you have lots of funding or whether or not you have lots of ideas about growth until you have an actual product um, that's valuable product that has a clear value proposition, um, the, the, the other things are, are, are not um, relevant. Um, once you have the product and you have a sense of what you're actually doing and who you're serving and how you're serving it, you have to have a community behind that, right? So product and then community, right? And once you have a product that's serving a community and there's some group of people engaging with that product, then you're in a position to think about, okay, what other partners can I bring in here? How can I refine this, improve it, iterate? How can I think about monetizing it? What grants might be relevant? What membership or subscription options might be relevant? What events or products could I create? Um, so that's kind of the, the order of, of operations. And we're talking about micro businesses. So just to be clear, we're not building the next Facebook. We're not building giant companies that are billion dollar valuations. We're building niche journalism ventures, micro ventures, projects that are serving niche communities. So typically these, there aren't projects that are capital intensive. So we're not raising lots and lots of money um, because we're not building factories. We're not hiring thousands of workers. We're building projects that are often one or few people working together to establish and clarify something of value. And once you have that and you, and you start building community and you start developing revenue streams, then some other things come into play. Um, but that's kind of the order of operations. So some of that entails some technical things, logistical things in terms of setting up the business. We have a couple sessions that are about some of the technical and logistical aspects, including one run by Amanda McLaughlin, who's a great entrepreneur herself and runs the Multitude podcast uh, company. Um, but a lot of it is is, um, is also about um, figuring out how to connect what your idea is and what, your, what the problem you're solving is with real people and how to iterate on that and improve that. Um, and then how to implement various different kinds of growth strategies. Um, that's really the core of what we're what we're focused on. I hope that answers those those questions. Um, other final questions before we wrap up. Um, somebody else had a question earlier. If you want to reiterate, Mike, I think that was you. I don't know if we got that question. Is that the question we just answered? Okay. Okay, great. Uh, any anyone else have a question that's burning? Otherwise, again, I'd encourage you to to take a look at the application as a next step. Once you see it, I think you'll see it's manageable, feasible. Um, if you have additional questions, ping us. Um, our email address is pretty straightforward, just ejcp at journalism.cuny.edu. You see it in the chat. We will share this recording out. So if there's something you didn't hear, I know some people came in late, et cetera, you, you can 
uh, listen back to the recording and hear anything you might have missed. You can follow up with us in any way that's most convenient for you. We are really excited. I am really excited about the upcoming cohort. I think this is going to be a fantastic, fantastic year. We've uh, learned a lot about what works in this program and, and what we can adjust. And we've made a lot of adjustments. We'll continue to make adjustments. And we have a fantastic plan in place for, for the next cohort for the spring. Some phenomenal people are going to be presenting and speaking and teaching and mentoring and coaching. Um, the participants who have already expressed interest and begun to apply are already a great group. So I'm really, really enthusiastic and optimistic about this group, really excited about 2024. I think it's going to be a really exciting year in the journalism ecosystem. That doesn't mean a year without challenges, but I think it's going to be a year with a lot of interesting and exciting developments, some of which will benefit creators significantly, uh, which I'm really excited about. So I encourage you to uh, to, to be a part of it if, it if it resonates with you and if it's of interest to you. Um, you could do, to answer the, the question I see in the chat, you could do two applications with two different projects. You could also note the two projects in one application to save yourself some of that challenge, but we're definitely open to, to people thinking about different ideas. Your idea might not be fully defined or you might have some questions. That's okay. We understand that that's the reality for people. We want people to be open-minded and flexible. Um, and that's, that's, that's totally, um, that's totally fine. And again, your project might be at a lot of different stages and that's also okay. And there've been people before you who are probably at whatever stage you're at too. So, so we're, we're familiar with that and we're okay. We're okay with that. And we're out of time. So thanks, especially to Tim, Ankur, Timmy, um, Flavian for, for all of our alums who have joined, um, Kyle, Ambreen, others on the team who have helped us set this up and to all of you who have joined, um, thanks for taking the time out. I'm sure there are many things you could do today. Thank you for caring enough about this subject and about your own, uh, um, career and your own interests to to show up and participate and and hopefully uh, we'll get to see you again in one way or another um, and uh, and good luck regardless of whether you're a part of this program or not good luck with your your venture and your work and have a great um, great week ahead.